Hello everyone, this is Frank DeFreitas and welcome to Holotalk, the Internet's weekly laser and holography talk show for the week of November 30th, 1998. We picked up quite a few new listeners last week, mostly due to the topic, which was creating holograms using a laser pointer. Steve Michael was the guest. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and hope that you continue with your interest to the point of actually setting up your own holography studio and creating holograms on your own. With this in mind, I thought it would be the perfect week to offer a holography primer for those listeners who have come back for more information. I went into my archives of materials and found an audio tape I recorded several years ago called The World of Holography. It covers the history of holography, how lasers work, it defines the types and styles of holograms, and looks at where holography is at present and where it could be going in the future. I hope you enjoy the presentation. I received quite a few emails with questions last week, and hopefully this program will be able to answer many of them. Before we get started, our guest next week is going to be Rob Taylor from Fourth Dimensional Holographics, who is going to fill us in on what's hot with retail holography this upcoming holiday season. If you're one of the new listeners who is interested in making holograms and selling them, you won't want to miss this show as it will give you some idea as to what the buying public is looking for. This will be the December 7th show. Okay, so here is the world of holography in its entirety. I won't be coming on after the presentation, so I will say thank you for tuning in. And don't forget to tune in each and every week when Holotalk brings you another new show right on your own computer anywhere in the world. This is Frank DeFreitas for Holotalk. Have a great week. Before I begin the actual presentation segment of this recording, I would like to take a moment to outline the segments that we'll be following. First, I would like to give a brief view of holography from a historical perspective, including how holography moved from the large government-funded research facilities into the home hobbyist environment. Moving on from there, I would like to cover the main components of the practice of making holograms. In the third segment, I will give a breakdown of the main types and styles of holograms currently available and their main similarities and differences. In the final segment, we'll cover where holography is today and where it will be tomorrow. So let us now move into our first segment, Holography from a Historical Perspective. Despite the widely held belief that holograms are a new technological innovation, the history of holography actually began in 1948, many years before the invention of the laser. It was at the Imperial College of London that a researcher named Dr. Dennis Gabor conceived of and produced the first hologram. The academic paper which he published entitled Image Formation by Reconstructed Wavefronts went on to earn him the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1971. Dr. Gabor used a carefully filtered sodium vapor lamp to make his early holograms. This limited the depth of the holograms to only the thickness of a postage stamp, but it worked and the rest is history. The actual intent of his research was to store an image which was illuminated with very short waves such as X-rays and then play the image back using very long waves. In essence, this would allow for great magnifications and improvement on the scanning electron microscope, which already could show tremendous detail of whatever was being imaged. It wasn't until the invention of the laser 12 years later that holography began to explore the beginnings of its potential. Today, even 1960 seems like ages ago, but it was the year of the invention of a device that would create a revolution. Of course, I am referring to the laser. The word laser is actually an acronym for the terms light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And at the time of its invention, there really wasn't a use for it. That was a very interesting time in our history, for here we are, as a race, creating a tool before anyone had a use for it. It was actually the first time in human history that this had been so. In fact, the laser was termed a solution in search of a problem. 
but there were researchers hard at work with the theories of Dennis Kabur at the time. Yuri Denishuk of the former Soviet Union and Emmett Leaf and Jewish Upetniks at the University of Michigan in the United States. These researchers took Gabor's theories, applied them using the special properties of light that only a laser can produce, and created the first true three-dimensional images we now call holograms. The scientific journals were absolutely filled with articles for years after the initial first holograms were created. It was actually seen as one of the most exciting inventions of this century. Not only articles in academic papers, but on the legal front, literally hundreds of patents were issued as research laboratories worked not only round the clock, but straight through the calendar year to come up with uses for this new technology. As the 60s began to come to a close, corporate interest began to wane, especially at the larger facilities that were receiving much of the defense spending on research and development. After nearly a decade, practical uses appeared to be on the way out. Fortunately, most of the excitement, at least for the everyday person, was just beginning. The mysteries that were surrounding the field like a curtain began to fade away, exposing the field to millions. One of the greatest revelations to come out of this transition was the fact that holography was not necessarily out of the reach of the amateur or hobbyist. Most felt that the field was too technical and expensive, primarily because of the fact that it was only being practiced in larger research laboratories. Both of these assumptions were incorrect. As far as too technical is concerned, most photographers do not understand the optical mathematics that go along with just the simplest camera. There's no reason to expect amateur holographers to do so either. Basic theory is really all that's needed here. And as far as the cost of equipment is concerned, if one has a basic understanding of the general theories behind the field, a person can actually make a home holography laboratory, or studio if you will, out of materials readily available from most home centers. And that is exactly what happened. Some of these home-made studios actually rivaled the larger laboratories in quality. A few actually surpassed it. And keep in mind, the savings of thousands of dollars off what the larger laboratories were paying for equipment. There's no doubt that it was a revolution. It created quite a bit of noise in the professional circles as well. I mean, tell me, how do you explain the person on the other side of town doing holograms in their basement that are actually comparable or even sometimes better in quality than the holograms you've been making on a system that just cost your company thousands of dollars? It was happening all over, and it is still happening today. There are three major areas of any holographic setup whether it's a professional studio laboratory at a research facility or a home hobbyist setup. There is the actual laser, the holography table which contains the lenses and mirrors used to make the hologram, and the darkroom where the development of the finished holographic plate takes place. The laser is a light producing device that projects a beam of light. The light that is produced by a laser has very special properties. It is these special properties that allow us to make a hologram. As of this date today, the laser is the only device that can produce this light. Lasers run in size from the size of a football field or larger to the size of a grain of salt. The most common laser used in the field of holography is the helium-neon laser. Other lasers are used as well. Argon lasers, helium-cadmium lasers, as well as pulsed ruby lasers are also used by some holographers. The diode laser, which is a tiny laser found in many devices such as CD players, are starting to make an appearance in a few laboratories for producing holograms, but as of this date are still in the research stage. The helium neon laser is used most often because of a few specific reasons. Most recording medium, such as holographic plates, are produced in large quantities for this laser. It also has the lowest cost of all the lasers, and it has the longest life with nearly a 20,000 hour maintenance free lifetime on the actual tube. The construction of a helium neon laser consists of a narrow glass tube 
similar in appearance to a typical neon sign that you find in the window of many delis and pizza shops. This tube is filled with a mixture of the gases helium and neon and is excited by using an electrical current flowing through the tube. This electrical current causes the gases in the tube to glow brightly. At e each end of the straight glass tube, mirrors are placed. One of the mirrors is 100% reflective, or it reflects 100% of the light striking it back through the tube again. At the other end of the tube, a mirror which is not quite 100% reflective is placed. Because this mirror does not reflect 100% of the light striking it back through the tube, a small percentage of the light passes through it. This is the end of the tube that the actual laser beam exits the laser. Because of the shape of the mirrors, they line up the light into a straight line, which is perceived as a beam. The actual physical construction of a helium-neon laser is quite simple. However, it is critical that the components are at specific distances from each other, especially the mirrors. They are placed at an exact multiple of the specific wavefront the laser is producing. Each color of the rainbow, from red through violet, has a specific wavelength. It is the difference in the measurement of the wavelengths that give us the different colors. The helium-neon laser produces a red beam, so it is said that it operates at the red end of the spectrum. The actual wavelength measurement is stated in the values which are called nanometers. The exact measurement of the wavelength that a helium-neon laser produces is 632.8 nanometers, or, rounded off, 633 nanometers. There are lasers which produce several distinct wavelengths, and lasers which produce only one at a time. A helium-neon laser can also be made to produce colors in both the yellow and green parts of the spectrum, but it can only produce one color at a time. This trait of producing only one color at a time is called monochromatic. Common household light bulbs produce nearly all the colors of the spectrum and are therefore the furthest things from monochromatic that you can get. Having a monochromatic light source is an important part of producing a hologram. The other special property of a laser is that the light it produces is termed coherent. This is the trait that really started the ball rolling in holography. A coherent light source has all of the waves that it produces in line with one another. I like to call it a wave train. Each wave of light is perfectly in step with one another. For comparison, an ordinary household light bulb is an incoherent source of light. All of the waves that it produces leave the light bulb in a random, haphazard fashion. A good example that I like to use to help people visualize this information is I ask them to picture themselves in a helicopter, stationary over the top of a crowd of people at an outdoor concert. Looking down, you see thousands of people, each dressed in different colors and haphazardly standing around in no specific, well-defined pattern. This would be the light that a household light bulb would produce. Now, I ask them to take their helicopter and hover over the parade marching down the main street of town. The band is moving in unison with one another, marching forward, all dressed in red uniforms. This is the light of a laser, one color or monochromatic and coherent, all waves moving along, one right behind the other. I hope this helps you get the picture in your mind of the difference between ordinary light and laser light. And yes, you can land your helicopter and go have an ice cream. The next component in any holographic setup is what is called the holography table, also known as the camera. There can be no vibrations to the system whatsoever when making a hologram so special tables must either be constructed or purchased, which absorb all vibrations before they reach the top of the table where the hologram is being made. The industry term for such a table is a vibration isolation system. The usual sizes for a table of this type is either 4x4 four four feet or 4x8 four feet. These tables can be purchased from scientific supply companies or they can be built using commonly found materials from local home centers or building supply companies. 
Most purchase systems are composed of three major components. A honeycomb tabletop, which has a core of honeycomb material and a stainless steel flat top. Cylinder legs, which floats the massive tabletop on a cushion of air. And an air compressor, which supplies the legs with the air for flotation. For high-budget government research, these tables are the best that money can buy. But we have to ask ourselves, what did the researchers use before there was holography in order to invent it? Well, the answer is, they constructed their own. Most amateur and hobbyist holographers build their own tables. The materials are easy to locate, and the cost is very inexpensive compared to a purchase system from a scientific supplier. Although the actual construction of a home table system is easy, it's beyond the scope of this tape to go into the details. Well, now you have a laser and a vibration isolation table and you're ready to make holograms. You plug in your laser and you're ready to go. You'll still need a few lenses and mirrors and of course holographic plates to actually put the images on. There are many different types of holograms you can make and I would like to cover a few of the styles here with you. But before I do, I would like to give my choices for the instructional books on making holograms. First, the book which I consider the definitive amateur's guide to making holograms is a manual titled The Holography Handbook, published by Ross Books in Berkeley, California. The second, for those of you further into the field, is Practical Holography, published by Prentice Hall. If you are planning on doing your own holograms, I want you to be successful and you cannot go wrong with either of these books for their practical advice and time-tested techniques. As I mentioned before, there are many types of holograms out there, and I would like to take a few moments to describe what it is you are looking at when you see one. I will start with the laser transmission hologram. Laser transmission holograms are the granddaddies of all holograms. They require a laser to make one and also a laser to view one. They are rarely seen outside the laboratory environment, however, and this is very unfortunate. If you ever want to get an idea of exactly what holography is capable of doing, make or view a laser transmission hologram. It will astound you. A second type of hologram is a white light transmission hologram. These holograms require a laser to make them, but they are viewable in ordinary white light situations, such as the sun or a light bulb. You may recognize them by the way they seem to change colors and appear to give a rainbow effect when viewing them. Actually, another term for them is rainbow holograms. But the laser transmission hologram and the white light transmission hologram are viewable with the source of light passing through the hologram from behind it and then traveling to the viewer's eye. Most of the holograms that are found on consumer products are white light transmission holograms. However, they have a silver backing, which acts like a mirror, so that when you view them, the light source does not have to travel through the hologram, but can come from the same side as the viewer. The silver backing reflects this light back through the hologram, as if the light were coming from behind and traveling through. A very simple, ingenious device that fools the hologram into thinking that the light is coming from behind when actually it is coming from the same side as the viewer. This leads us to a reflection hologram. Reflection hologram replays itself with the light coming from the same side as the viewer, hence the term reflection. It reflects the light back to the eyes of the viewer. However, unlike the silver-backed white light transmission holograms, with a reflection hologram, the actual hologram reflects the light back to the viewer not a silver backing. Reflection holograms are easy and fun to make for the home hobbyist. However, they require a bit more stability in your system than the transmission type of hologram. Another type of hologram that seems to be making a comeback is the multiplex hologram. Also known as a stereogram, these holograms are actually pieces of film which are contained in a cylinder. The cylinder rotates and the holographic image appears to move. This movement is made possible by the fact that the original image was first recorded onto standard motion picture film and then transferred in a special way onto the holographic film. I like to call them pseudo-holograms 
because of the fact that they were first shot onto a traditional media such as movie film and then transferred and made into a hologram. However, the effect is always entertaining and some very interesting images have been created in this fashion. Some simple types of multiplex holograms can be made at home by the hobbyist, but the commercial quality multiplex requires quite a bit of equipment and a fairly high degree of skill and knowledge to pull it off. Holography at present is being used in a number of technical and artistic endeavors. Automobile manufacturers are using holography to test their engines with a technique that is called holographic interferometry. Turbine engines, medical implants, and numerous consumer products are tested this way to see how each reacts under stress situations. Commercial airline pilots are using holography to view their instrumentation by projecting it out into space in front of the aircraft. This way, they do not have to take their eyes off the sky to see the status of their most important instruments. Automobile manufacturers will be including this device, known as a heads-up display, in cars in the near future. Some cars have it as an option right now. Can we expect to see our friends and loved ones projected into our homes in the future? The possibility is certainly there, as what is termed real-time holography is being worked on at such facilities as the Media Laboratory at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This will allow holograms to be transmitted in real time without any time delay from when the hologram is made to when it is viewed. One of the biggest explosions holography has made to date has been in the graphic arts industry. Holograms are beginning to appear on a regular basis on magazine covers, advertisements, on consumer packaging, and even on articles of clothing. It is a well-documented fact that including a hologram on a product or including a hologram in an advertisement will increase the consumer's response. The major drawback to most users of holography or potential users is the cost factor. Setup charges for creating a hologram to be used in this fashion is currently cost prohibitive for most. However, recent advances in creating holographic masters which are used to reproduce the millions of holographic copies might be moving this cost into an acceptable range. These types of holograms can actually be produced using a desktop computer and a specially fitted laser printer. At this point in the game, several producers are experimenting with this method, but the majority of consumer-related graphic arts holograms are still being produced in the traditional but costly manner. Because of the difficulty reproducing holograms, many companies have found them invaluable as a deterrent to counterfeiters. Most major credit cards have holograms on them, and the possibility of including them on U.S. currency is currently being reviewed. Out of all the currency in the world, United States paper is currently near the top of the list when it comes to ease of reproduction. Recently, a major counterfeiting operation was closed which was producing counterfeit holograms. But as far as we know, this was an isolated incident. Holograms are still, by far, the best insurance against counterfeiters known today. As the world continues to discover the magic of holography, and as more and more applications which seem like science fiction only a few years ago become reality, we will continue, little by little, to view the standards of imaging which we feel is so high-tech and advanced with less and less excitement. The day will come when it will seem almost primitive to see an image which does not appear three-dimensionally in front of us. The widescreen, high-definition digital TVs which give us such an astounding picture of the world around us will suddenly seem flat and missing something. They will be sold or taken up to the resting place in the attic while we actively enjoy beautiful, full-color, three-dimensional concerts, sporting events, and yes, even romantic rendezvous, which will be so lifelike that not only will it seem like we're there, we actually will be. I am happy for your forward and future-mindedness with your interest in the field of holography. For me, it has been literally a lifetime of adventure and discovery. 
I hope you stay with us on this journey will be long and rewarding. And I hope you're still with us when we move into that promised day and age when we can look back and say that we were all pioneers in this headstrong field we've come to call holography.